Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 52nd Blueheads Virtual Seminar. Blueheads Virtual Seminar is a platform that allows healthcare professionals to discuss current management updates of different health related topics for better patient care. And this platform is brought to you by Blue Health Ethiopia, a medical consultancy company founded by medical doctors and a computer engineer. And we aim to be an influential healthcare leader in creating a skilled community through easily accessible knowledge in preventive medicine. And I'm your host, Dr. Rino Tadela, a general, a general physician and first aid trainer from Blue Health Ethiopia. Today, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Mulu Alam Alamayo here with us to give a presentation on the approach to supraventricular tachycardia. So Dr. Mulu Alam is an internist and adult cardiologist at Gesund Cardiac Center. Thank you, Dr. Hino. Welcome again uh, to this session on uh, approach to supraventricular tachycardia. So I'm Dr. Mulu Alam. Uh, these are the outlines of my presentation. We'll uh, define the term SVT. We'll talk a few things about the pathogenesis uh, or the mechanisms leading to SVT and how patients usually uh, present to, 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 uh, to healthcare centers and uh, uh, how to differentiate between the, the different types of uh, SVTs based on the ECGs. And we'll talk about the acute management, which is the most important part, and uh, the long-term management as well, which usually is done in consultation with uh, tertiary uh, care providers. Uh, so SVTs are uh, usually defined as tachycardias, the mechanism of which involves or the vital part of tachycardia involves a tissue from the his bundle or for above, uh, that means the AV node, uh, the atrial tissue, and the SA node as well, including the, the his bundle. Uh, and uh, traditionally, it describes all the, the tachycardia, except the ventricular the tachycardia and atrial fibrillation, which which are uh, which are uh, significantly different presentations and different uh, management uh, options. And uh, many of the SVTs present uh, as narrow complex tachycardias. Occasionally, they can be of wider uh, QI duration, and almost uh, always they are tachycardias of a regular rhythm. And as you can see this picture, this is a depiction of cardiac conduction system. So the SVTs they involve all issues. Uh, uh, including the his bundle and those above, including the AV node, uh, the SA node, the atrial tissue, and the, the other tissues between the conduction systems, but above the, the bundle of his. And uh, with this normal conduction system, expect normal sinus rhythm, which, which is uh, defined as having regular rhythm with rates between 60 to 100. And uh, this uh, uniform relation between the P and QRS waves. And in SVTs, uh, uh, there is derangement in this normal sinus rhythm, and we see uh, unique patterns for, for each of the, the, the SVTs we'll, we'll discuss. So, classification wise, classify them usually uh, based on whether they involve tissues in the AV junction, meaning the AV node or the, the ventral fees, or whether they are purely limited to the, to the uh, atrial tissue. So those which are limited to the atrial tissue include the sinus tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, uh, AFib, and atrial flutter. And those that involve the junctional tissue include AVNRT, AVRT, and uh, junctional tachycardia. And almost all of them present uh, paroxysmally. So the term uh, PSVT or paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia is commonly used to, to describe uh, all of this uh, rhythm abnormalities. Uh, and the majority of these SVTs are, are caused by uh, AVNRT or atrioventricular nodal intraventricular tachycardia, uh, followed by AVNRT and 
focal like cardiac as well. So the classification, as I said, uh, is based on whether they involve purely the, the atrial tissue uh, with uh, sinus like cardias, uh, focal atrial like cardias, and mat or focal uh, atrial like cardias being uh, the commonly mentioned ones. And, uh, the other macro reentrant atrial like cardia, which is uh, atrial flutter, is also in this, in this classification. And atrial fibrillation is also part of this classification, but uh, it is not dealt with as with, uh, SCBT in, in, in any clinical practice. And those that involve the, the junctional tissue include the avinodal reentrant like cardia, which can be the typical one, uh, whereby the, the integrated conduction is via the slow pathway and the retrograde conduction is via the, fa the fast pathway or the atypical, the atypical ones which conduct in a different manner to, to the typical one. And atroventricular intran tachycardias typically they use accessory tissue or accessory pathway that connects the, the atria and the ventricles uh, a distance away from, from the AV node. So epidemiology wise, uh, Usually, the, the the prevalence and the incidence are, are reported to be like 2.2 uh, per 100, and prevalence of around uh, incidence of around 36 per 100,000 people. These are data from, from Western countries, the US and Europe, and uh, they are uh, more commonly seen in women, and usually they are seen here in. Uh, younger patients particularly compared to uh, atrial fibrillation whereby age is the most important risk factor uh, and uh, among these uh, SVTs in, 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 in almost all of the data even artists dominate particularly uh, starting from uh, the second and third decade of life but in the early years uh, the first two decades of life heavy artists can be the dominant type because uh, the accessory pathway, pathways are uh, something we are, we are born with and early manifestations, including children, uh, is a possibility for, for AVRT. And atrial tachycardias usually develop in elderly patients and those with, with structural heart disease. That's the common, uh, common pattern. Uh, and in AVRT, typically they are the, the women dominate uh, with two to one ratio. Uh, and in AVRTs, uh, men predominant, predominant uh, many of the patients are men. The reason for, for the sex uh, predilection of this uh, SVT is, is not uh, well understood. And focal ATs, as I said, the, the prevalence increases with increasing age, and they make up a significant proportion of SVTs in, in uh, elderly patients. And they are uh, also more common with, with uh, structural heart disease. And uh, at times they can they can they can be incessant or uh, uh, unlike the other uh, SVTs, they are uh, they are less likely to be paroxysmal. And this incessant presentation can lead to uh, cardiomyopathy, which is usually tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy. So the edge the, the presentation. Uh, of the type of SVT and age uh, are uh, well depicted in this picture. As you can see, uh, in the early years, uh, AVRT predominates from the early years, from usually up to 20 years. Uh, but after that, the, the proportion of patients with AVNRT predominate. And in the later years of life, a significant proportion of, of uh, atrial tachycardia is beautifully depicted in this picture. Pathogenesis wise, uh, so uh, tachyarrhythmias usually the, the mechanisms they are either uh, because of uh, uh, abnormal impulse generation or abnormal impulse conduction. Uh, in, the, in the generation part, uh, increased automaticity or, or uh, triggered activity are, are important mechanisms. And uh, this increased automaticity can, can lead to some of the atrial tachycardias. And the other mechanism is abnormal conduction, impulse conduction, which is uh, the predominant mechanism in most of the SVTs, as you can see here. 
and uh, this one this abnormal conduction usually is uh, because of reentrant uh, circuits as you can see here in the, in the uh, around the av node uh, these reentrant circuits can can result in av nrt and uh, other reentrant reentrant circuits between the atria and ventricle a bit of a distance away from from the av node can result in avrt uh, sort of the, the commonly known uh, syndromes like the, the WPW syndrome or wolf five parkinson white syndrome. And uh, even in the, atrial, in, in the atrial tissue itself, uh, atrial flutter with, with tissues close to the carbotricuspid tri isthmus is being involved. And uh, in the SA node as well, reentrant circuits can be, can be seen and uh, this can result in uh, different types of SVTs. So reentry is uh, responsible for most of most of the arrhythmias. Uh, increased automaticity, automaticity can also cause some atrial hyperparesis. So as you can see, this is uh, commonly uh, described uh, triangular coach, uh, which which uh, is responsible for pathogenesis of AVNRT, whereby we have uh, abnormal conduction. Uh, between between through, through the atrioventricular node, whereby we have uh, two types of conductions: uh, the fast pathway as well as uh, the slow pathway. And in the typical uh, AVNRT, the slow pathway conducts anteriorly, whereas the fast pathway conducts uh, in retrograde uh, fashion. And they have uh, different properties, whereby the fast pathway conducts in, in a rapid manner but has longer uh, refractory period. Uh, allowing for it to, to allow uh, re to form a reentry circuit from impulses that have been conducted through, through the slow pathway. And uh, the tachycardia mechanism is sustained by reentry of, of uh, electrical impulse between these uh, two tissues. And the triangle is formed, as you can see, by the AV node, uh, septal inflate of the tricuspid valve and the, the coronary sinus. And this anatomic location is important because that's what guides the, the, the ablation of these uh, arrhythmias. As I said, uh, AVNRT uh, is mediated by uh, two alternate pathways with different uh, conduction properties, whereby the fast pathway has, has uh, rapid conduction but a long uh, effective refractory period, and the slow pathway has. Uh, the direct, uh, the, the features are direct opposite of the, the fast pathway. And uh, the typical uh, reentrant circuit is established by, by usually because of a premature bit that conducts slowly through through uh, the slow pathway that has short effective refractory period. So after the normal rhythm or sinus rhythm is conducted through this slow pathway, if the patient has developed a premature atrial complex, since uh, the refractory period is uh, very short, it's ready to, to conduct uh, an impulse, and thus premature impulse can conduct through this uh, slow pathway, but it cannot conduct through the fast pathway because of the prolonged uh, refra effective refractory period, and thus the, the, the electrical impulse forms uh, a circuit or conducts through the slow pathway, and when it reaches uh, to the slow pathway, after conducting to the fast pathway, after conducting through the slow pathway, the, 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 this has already finished its refractory period and is ready to, to accept uh, the electrical uh, signal. And this uh, reentry circuit is established, leading to, to uh, AV NART. And uh, when we see the clinical presentation, usually uh, the common presentation is with palpitations, which are of sudden onset and sudden uh, termination. Uh, and it's only for prolonged episodes that, that patients can present to, to uh, centers because many of the, the, the episodes are short, lasting only a few minutes or uh, even a few seconds. And when they come to, to our, our, uh, our setup, the arrhythmia usually is, is done. But few of the patients can present with prolonged duration of the arrhythmias and they can have. Uh, continuous uh, palpitations. And uh, they can also present with dyspnea, chest pain, uh, dizziness, 
and occasionally or uh, few patients can present with uh, syncope as well. But among the, the tachyarrhythmic cause of syncope, SCVTs are, are uh, the less important ones. Razor uh, ventral tachycardias are more important cause of syncope. But some of the patients can have uh, SCVT, can have uh, syncope, and uh, our workup may reveal that the SCVT has been uh, responsible. And overall, over the long term, the impact of SCVT depends on uh, the frequency and the duration of the symptoms. And patients with repeated symptoms uh, and prolonged episodes have uh, troublesome quality of life, and they usually uh, require treatment, be it medically or, or with uh, ablation of the, the pathways leading to the articles. And during the initial evaluation, the history, as we said, uh, the physical exam. The physical exam, if the patient's present during the episode of uh, tachycardia, can, can reveal the, the, uh, the pounding uh, or, the, or the, the, what we call the neck pounding or the frog sign in the jugular veins of these patients, particularly in avian NRTs. Otherwise, other signs of structural RTs are not seen. And the ECG during the, the period of the arrhythmia can, can, uh, can help us determine uh, the type of the SCVT. And to look for the cause of the SCVT, CBC, usually looking for uh, anemia or uh, infections, which can result in uh, sinus tachycardia. And in the, in the biochemical profile, we need to do the, the basic organ function test electrolytes, and also the thyroid function is important because it can lead to, to different types of arrhythmias, including sinus tachycardia and uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, and uh, sometimes the ECG may, may show ST depressions as well, which can be confused with, with uh, uh, ischemia, but uh, uh, patients with no other risk factors for for coronary artery disease with, with clear history of SCVT, uh, the ST depression as well as the, the occasional troponin elevations, they are unrelated to, to coronary artery problems. And echocardiography is helpful to look for uh, structural artery disease. And other additional tests usually will depend on the, the, the type of the patient. In patients who have exertional symptoms or exertional uh, palpitations during exercise uh, ECG can be helpful. It can reveal the, 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 uh, the tachycardia. And in patients with infrequent symptoms, uh, prolonged ECG monitoring, be it with uh, alter ECG or, or other uh, prolonged recording mechanisms is helpful to, to document the ischemia. And in patients with uh, risk, fa risk factors for coronary artery disease, working the patients for possible uh, Chemical disease can be helpful. And in patients uh, who are being considered for title, title ablation, uh, electrophysiologic study is, is uh, recommended as well. Uh, because not only, uh, we don't only want to diagnose the patients uh, once we do this type of invasive tests, the intervention needs to be, to be planned as well. And as I said in the, in the, in the clinical presentation, during the, the Episodes of uh, tachycardia and neck pounding is common because of the, the simultaneous contraction of the atria and the ventricles, leading to uh, atrium array contracting against a closed tricuspid valve and just the, the, the bell returning back to the, the venous system, particularly the, the superior vena cava and the jugular veins. And we can see that regular, uh, regular uh, canon A waves in these patients. And unlike in patients with uh, PTAC, uh, the canon waves are regular, this type of patients. In, in PTAC, usually there is a dissociation of the artery and the ventricles, and these waves uh, occur intermittently. But in these patients, uh, the, the waves are uh, regular. And they, they are usually typically seen in avian RT compared to, to AVRT, because in avian NRT, the, the contraction of the artery and the ventricles occurs simultaneously because uh, the typical AVNRT, the retrograde pathway is a fast pathway and the impulse reach, reach to the atria 
uh, simultaneously to, to, to the ventricles. And polyuria during absorption of uh, high cardiac ambition because of increased RA pressures and thus increased level of natriuretic uh, peptides. A dizziness based on uh, related to or relation to the, the degree of the hypotension can be seen, particularly in the, in the first minute, because once uh, the patient develops a uh, hypotension, compensatory mechanisms uh, via the sympathetic uh, nervous system can help to, to stabilize the BP, and thus uh, the dizziness usually is short lived. And as I said early, earlier, rarely patients can have true syncop syncope. Uh, particularly in elderly patients and patients with with uh, uh, AVRT with with axillary pathways that are able to, to, to conduct uh, in anti-grade fashion, whereby uh, uh, the AVRT can degenerate into AFI, and the AFI, particularly if it is uh, conducting over over uh, uh, a very fast axillary pathway can result in rapid ventricular response and occasionally can degenerate into ventricular uh, fibrillation. And this is uh, the mechanism of uh, sudden cardiac disease in this type of patients. And syncope can be uh, can be seen in these patients. But in an otherwise young patient with SCBT, syncope usually is vagally mediated and is usually benign. And in patients with underlying structural heart disease, uh, SCVTs can result in decompensation of uh, heart failure or, or uh, worsening of uh, ischemia, and uh, patients may not tolerate SCVTs as well uh, as in uh, young and healthy subjects. And occasionally, uh, so as I said, most of the SCVTs are paroxysmal and they are less likely to, indu to induce cardiomyopathy, but some variants like, like uh, focal atrial tachycardias and uh, the junction are uh, reciprocating tachycardias. Uh, they can be incessant and uh, they can they can uh, present uh, significant tachycardic load to the LV and can result in uh, cardiomyopathy. And uh, to uh, so the ACG can tell us a lot about uh, the type of SCV in these patients. And usually the, we approach the ACGs uh, in this pattern, whereby we try to look as, uh, at the regularity of the tachycardia. As we said, most of the ACVTs, they are uh, almost all, all of them, they are uh, of uh, regular rhythm. Uh, so only when there is uh, intermittent conduction block that, that the ACVTs can be irregular, or it's because of uh, other uh, arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation whereby uh, we see irregularity. And even in atrial fibrillation, when the, the, the ventricular rate is very high, the rhythm may, may, may look like it is, or may seem regular, but closer inspection or, or inspection of the fibrillatory waves with slowing of uh, the, the arrhythmia can, can show that uh, it's indeed atrial fibrillation. And then we look, we look at the atrial activity or we try to depict the P waves, whether they are similar to the P waves we expect in sinus rhythm or the other type of arrhythmias. And we also try to characterize the relation between the P waves and the QRS, uh, usually using the, 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 the RP interval, whereby uh, we can look at the, the, the type of the reentry circuit between uh, the ventricle and the atria. And we also need to look at the QRS morphology, as I said, some of the the, uh, the SCVTs can, can can present as wide complex tachycardias, uh, and the differentiating between these uh, SCVTs and ventricular tachycardias is helpful. And we also need to look at interventions, particularly the, the impact that vagal maneuvers or adenosine has on the on the rhythm. So regularity, as I said, most of them are regular. If we see an irregularly irregular narrow complex tachycardia, the differentials usually are uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, multifocal AT, or uh, atrial fibrillation or atrial tachycardia with variable conduction. Uh, and the atrial activity P waves uh, in some of the arrhythmias, they can be easily seen, but in some of the, the SCVTs, they can be buried within the QRS or the ST segment or the T waves. And thus, uh, 
they they can they can be uh, difficult to, to identify uh, and comparing the baseline ecg if we have one is to the ecg during arrhythmia and cell phone and we can look at the changes even if we cannot identify the t waves we can look at the changes in the qrs the st segment of the t waves during the arrhythmia periods and we can uh, we can uh, identify the p waves as 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 uh, altered morphology in the in the other uh, in the other segments like particularly uh, picking of t waves or alteration in the in the qrs morphology can be seen in if we scrutinize the ecg compared to, to comparing it to the ecg obtained during, during uh, sinus rhythm and uh, by slowing usually the, the, the conduction between the atria and the ventricles, and by slowing the ventricular rates using the uh, uh, vagal maneuvers or uh, adenosine therapy, we can uh, better uh, delineate the periods and we can, uh, we can take a closer look at their uh, morphology. The atria rates usually uh, Atrial rates uh, above 250, usually up to 300, are commonly seen with atrial flutter. In uh, AT and AVRT rates, usually are uh, less compared to, to, to atrial flutter, but uh, this is not a definitive way to diagnose them. And in atrial fibrillation, the fibrillatory uh, waves, they can be seen at rates, uh, very high rates like 500 or, or even above that. And this, uh, the typical presentation, for example, for atrial flutter is uh, atrial rate of 300 with two to one conduction and uh, ventricular uh, rate of uh, usually around 150. This is usually typical for atrial flutter, but there, there are uh, significant variations uh, in, in the rate of arrhythmias uh, across uh, the spectrum of the SVTs. And the P wave morphology, if it is identical to the one seen in sinus P wave, so the differential diagnosis is more of uh, sinus tachycardia, uh, which can be physiologic or, or uh, inappropriate, or sinus uh, sinoatrial nodal intran tachycardia, uh, or atrial tachycardia arising from uh, atrial tissue very close to the sinus node, and this the P wave may resemble that of uh, sinus P wave in sinus rhythm. The other uh, non sinus P wave morphology is seen in AVNRT, AVRT and other uh, types. And in uh, atrial flutter, usually we don't have uh, isoelectric uh, baseline. You see the, the flutter waves typically in the, in the inferior leads. Uh, in atrial tachycardia, usually there are, you see atrial uh, rasoelectric lines, but in some atrial tachycardia with uh, very high rates, uh, this uh, undulation in the baseline uh, uh, can also be present and uh, may be confusing with atrial flutter. Uh, usually, the P waves in typical AVNRT they are usually buried in the QRS complex and they are not usually uh, visible. The other, uh, the other type part of the ACG that we need to uh, take a closer look at is uh, the RP interval or uh, the type of conduction between uh, the ventricle and the atria. So, Typically, with with, uh, with typical AVNRTs, as I said, the retrograde conduction is with via fast fast pathway, and just the, the the QRS and the P wave they are very close to, to each other, and the P wave uh, can be easily uh, buried within the QRS complex. So it 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 may it may be invisible or or it may result in only uh, slight alteration in the morphology of the, the the QR is wave. As you can see here, uh, in, the, in the, the second sample ECG, P wave is not uh, seen. And the typical SVT is that results in uh, invisible P waves with, with uh, narrow QRS type cardia is uh, AVNRT. And uh, the other is. Uh, Short RP SVTs, short being usually, uh, as you can see here, we can see the, the, the P wave in the, in the, at the end part of the, the 
QRS or in the ST segment. And this can be caused by uh, AVRTs or occasionally with AVNRTs. But uh, the, the RP duration usually is shorter in uh, AVNRTs, usually less than 90 milliseconds. And it is more than that in uh, AVR, AVR, AVRT. Because as I said, the axillary pathway is a distance away from, from the nodal tissue. And long RP tachycardias, whereby the distance between the R wave and the P wave is very long, is usually seen in uh, atrial tachycardia. Uh, it can also be seen in atypical uh, AVNRT, whereby the retrograde pathway conducts slowly. Uh, and the RP, uh, looking at the RP is helpful in differentiating this arrhythmia. As you can see here, this is the, the general approach to, to a narrow QRS tachycardias. First, we need to look whether they are uh, regular or not. Irregular, irregularity usually means uh, atrial fibrillation or uh, SVT with uh, variable conduction or multifo multifocal atrial tachycardia, which is a typical arrhythmia for patients with COPD. So the clinical scenario is uh, important as well. And in uh, if the tachycardia is regular, then the second part is looking at the P waves, whether they are visible or not. If they are invisible, as I said, they are buried within the QRS complex, and thus AVNRT is the most likely diagnosis. If they are uh, visible, we need to, to look at the correlation between the atrial rate and the ventricular rate. And if we have more P waves compared to the QRS, then that is atrial flutter or atrial tachycardia with a degree of uh, conduction block. But uh, if the conduction is one to one, then we need to, to analyze the RP interval. And if the RP interval is uh, very short, as I said, it's most likely to be AVNRT. And if it is uh, longer, uh, it's more likely to be uh, atrial tachycardia. And uh, a duration that is somehow uh, results in equal RP to PR intervals is commonly seen in, in AVRTs. And the QRS morphology, as I said, typically is uh, narrow complex, but some of the, SP, the SVTs can result in wide complex tachycardia. That can be because of uh, uh, rate related aberrant conduction or pre existing conduction block like LVBs or RVBs, or because of ventricular uh, pre excitation because of anti conducting uh, bypass tract or accessory pathway. And uh, the wide QRS tachycardias, typically they are caused by ventricular tachycardia, but occasionally, as I said, they can be caused by uh, SVTs because of different mechanisms. And uh, many of the SVTs result in uh, a regular uh, wide complex tachycardias. But sometimes uh, patients may have uh, FE or atrial flutter with, with variable degrees of conduction. And also, uh, pre excited FE can, can result in irregularly irregular form of. Uh, wide complex tachycardias. And uh, while trying to differentiate between uh, the cause of the wide QRS tachycardia, there are different criteria to look at. So the slowing or termination by vagal tone, it tells us that the AV load is conducted in the, uh, is involved in the, in the mechanism of the arcane, and just that is suggestive of having uh, uh, tachycardia. And uh, onset with, with uh, premature uh, P wave, uh, that's also suggestive of uh, SVT. And uh, uh, the, the link between the P and QRS, uh, whereby we have more P waves than, than QRS uh, waves, is also suggestive of uh, SVTs. And uh, if we have uh, Typical features of BT like uh, fusion beats, capture beats, AV dissociation, whereby we see independent BT compared to, to the QRS complex, and uh, significantly prolonged duration in the in the in the QRS waves. Those are suggestive of uh, BTs. As you can see here, uh, we have a wide complex tachycardia, but we see uh, independent atrial activities intermittently, with with uh, no relation to the QRS complex whatsoever. And this is uh, suggestive of AV dissociation. And we can also see uh, 
capture beats uh, the first uh, altered altered QRS complex is uh, capture beats uh, for for uh, sorry that's a fusion beats and uh, these are uh, these are captures and uh, the fusion beats it's, it is uh, a mix of uh, the wide complex tachycardia and uh, the normal uh, conduction and uh, the capture beats are normal uh, QRS complexes that are conducted within, within uh, the type card. And the other is uh, the, the presence of concordance, uh, be it positive or negative, that's also subjective of uh, ventricular type And uh, the other uh, Evaluation of ACG, it, it, it is, um, we need to look at the response of the, the, the tachycardia to vagal maneuvers or to, to adenosine. And uh, the absence of uh, any effect on the tachycardia, it, it's because, it can be because of inadequate dose or delivery of the adenosine because uh, we need to be cautious when administering adenosine. We need to administer uh, fast uh, IV push uh, with, with uh, uh, followed by uh, fast uh, flushing of saline. And uh, uh, if we, we do not maintain the, the correct way of administering, administering adenosine, we may miss a diagnosis. And the other is high septal VTs, uh, because they are very close to the, the normal conduction system. They can result in uh, narrow QRS SCBT and can, uh, can be mistaken for SCBTs. And uh, this type of uh, tachycardias, they do not respond to adenosine because they do not involve the AV node. And uh, the other type of response can be gradual slowing, uh, then uh, reacceleration after the, 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 the effect of adenosine is uh, uh, after the, the effect of adenosine finishes. These tachycardias usually are uh, sinus tachycardia, uh, focal AT, or junctional ectopic tachycardia. And sudden uh, complete termination usually is uh, diagnostic of AVNRT, uh, AVRT, and sometimes sinus nodal reentry as well because the sinus node is so responsive for, for adenosine. And uh, persistent tachycardia with uh, high grade AV blocks whereby the adenosine effect is only the conduction between the atria and uh, the ventricles, but not uh, the, the mechanism of the, the arrhythmia. Uh, that's typically seen in atrial flutter. And we can clearly delete the uh, flutter waves after administering adenosine in these patients. So these are uh, typical ECGs of uh, uh, SCVTs. This is uh, atrial flutter. You can clearly see the flutter waves in the, in the inferior layers, layer 3, layer 2, and the AVF. Uh, this is a typical atrial flutter, and there is no isoelectric line between, between the P waves. Uh, and uh, typically, in, in typical atrial flutter, the, the, the P waves are negative in the inferior layers and usually positive in the uh, V1. Uh, this is Atrial tachycardia, somehow it is uh, similar to, to atrial flutter, but uh, we can clearly see uh, isoelectric lines between, between, between the P waves, uh, like uh, atrial flutter. And uh, typical orthodromic AVNRT, as I said, uh, retrograde conduction is via fast pathway, and the P waves are usually difficult to discern or they form part of the QRS complex. As you can see here, they appear as uh, pseudo R waves, uh, many of the leads. And looking at all the leads is important because this, these waves can be seen in only some of the, the, the ACGs and they may not be seen in, uh, in the remaining leads. This is also another uh, picture of AVNRT and the P waves are not well seen in this, in this uh, uh, is deep and narrow complex uh, tachycardia with no visible PFs. That's typically uh, a feature of AVNRT. Uh, this is uh, AVR, AVRT. 
whereby uh, the UFs usually appear halfway between uh, uh, subsequent uh, or consecutive RR, RR intervals. Usually, they they uh, they change the appearance of the P waves. As you can see here, there is no change on the, on the P waves in this in this ECG. And in some of uh, the QRS complexes, they can result in uh, uh, they can they can uh, they can result in pointed uh, T waves, as you can see in this ECG. Uh, and comparison with the resting ECG before the RTMA ensues is, is important they using these this patterns. This is uh, AVRT that's conducting uh, anti grade leave uh, as accessory pathway. So the accessory pathways uh, with AVRT, the usual type is uh, orthodromic type, whereby the anti grade conduction is, is via the AV node, and the retrograde conduction is via. Uh, the accessory pathway, and that's why we have uh, narrow complex tachycardias in AVRT. But the unusual type of uh, AVRTs can uh, conduct anti-gradely via the accessory pathway, and the delta waves can be uh, clearly seen during a source of tachycardia, which is uh, in sharp contrast to the orthodromic type. And uh, the delta waves. Uh, Based on their, their location, they can uh, manifest differently on the ECG. As you can see here, uh, there is a slurring of the initial portion of the QRS complex, and uh, there is shortening of the PR interval as well. And the delta waves, usually if they appear positive on the V1, they are uh, left-sided, and if they are negative on, on V1, they are uh, right-sided. Uh, that's helpful in uh, locating these axillary pathways for fighter ablation. And this is a very important ECG, whereby we see wide complex, wide complex irregular uh, tachycardia with with uh, uh, with a slurring of the, the initial portion of the QRS, or with uh, visible delta waves in, in clearly seen in some of the, the QRS complexes. And this is uh, we need to be cautious with this type of uh, tachycardia because uh, using drugs that that block. Uh, the AV node in this type of tachycardia can result in uh, 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 worsening of the arrhythmia because uh, many of the drugs that, that block the AV node do not have effect on the uh, anti-gradely conducting axillary pathway, and uh, it can, this can ensue in very fast ventricular responses, and these type of arrhythmias can, can uh, degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. So, uh, Either electrical cardioversion or use of drugs that's at slow conduction, both in the accessory pathway as well as, well as in the AV node, uh, shall be used to, to terminate this arrhythmia. And when we see the management, uh, can be classified in acute management uh, and chronic management. And some of the arrhythmias uh, they require specific management tailored to, to, to their unique behaviors. Acute management it depends on the presentation of the patient. Patients, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, so the, 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 the management is going to be uh, electrical cardioversion. But for patients with hemodynamic or hemodynamically stable, with, with normal DP, uh, with so, there's no signs of uh, pulmonary edema, no sedimentation, we can, we can use uh, different maneuvers, including maneuvers. And we can use drugs to terminate the arrhythmias. And the chronic management depends on the mechanism and the, uh, the burden of the ACVT. And we'll see uh, each of them. So the acute management usually it's, it's based on the, the uh, impacting the atrioventricular conduction, usually at, uh, at AV node. And drugs that slow the AV uh, node conduction can, can uh, terminate the arrhythmias because the AV node is a vital part of. Uh, Many of the, the, the SCBTs. And uh, even if we do not terminate the arrhythmias for, for uh, SCBTs that, that do not uh, integrally require the AV node, we can slow the ventricular conduction via, via our effect on the AV node and we can stabilize patients, patients via that. And we can uh, clearly delineate the arrhythmias as well. So, acute conversion of SCBT, we can use vagal maneuvers. 
Kali with with Balsalva or carotid sinus massage. Balsalva, whereby we be sufficient to 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 strain or hold their breath is the usually commonly used one. And carotid sinus massage is also an option, whereby we apply pressure on the carotid sinus usually for five seconds, and we can we can. Can increase uh, the vagal tone of the, the patients. This can also help, help to terminate the arrhythmias. And uh, success rates usually is, is limited. And success rates is usually determined by the duration of the arrhythmia. So, in patients who, are, who had only uh, short lived arrhythmia, like for a few seconds before the sympathetic tone, uh, for the sympathetic tone. Uh, it tries to respond to, to, to the hypotension issues, we can terminate the arrhythmias. But once the sympathetic tone is uh, strengthened, it's difficult to terminate the arrhythmia with vagal maneuvers. And uh, modified valsalva, whereby uh, we, we ask the patient to raise their legs uh, to increase the venous return and thus uh, to decrease reflex sympathetic tone, has been shown to, to increase uh, success rate in some studies. And in uh, pediatric patients, uh, partial immersion in water, whereby uh, we immerse the face of the, the, the patient in a, in a cold water can terminate the arrhythmia. And this can also work in some adults because it can, can uh, uh, it potentiates the parasympathetic nervous system. We are, we are similarly, we are vagal maneuvers. And we need to educate patients about vagal maneuvers because patients can be far away from the healthcare facility and they need to try uh, the Valsalva maneuver by themselves. And uh, if not if successful, that's, that's uh, very helpful. If not, they may come to... Usually it potentiates the, the, the potassium channels the, or acts in a similar manner to, to vagal uh, pathways. Uh, and it works in many of the patients. And if they are not responding to adenosine, as I said, we can go to, to uh, other uh, second line drugs like the beta blockers or the calcium channel blockers based on the, the availability uh, in our center. And uh, this is uh, these are recommendations from 2019 uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines on, on supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, it's a really helpful guideline, and you can find many of uh, the management recommendations from, from them. Uh, so this is basically what we talked about and uh, unstable patients right away to going to, to cardioversion. For those who are stable, we can use the vagal maneuvers and, and subsequently adenosine and uh, other drugs. And uh, uh, some of the patients, as I said, can present with wide QR stack cardia and trying to, to, to to identify the cause of the white QR stachycardia can be helpful, particularly in patients who are hemodynamically stable, because that can help us plan the long term management. But if the patients are not uh, hemodynamically stable, by the way, the treatment is going to be uh, uh, electrical cardio version. Uh, and uh, in patients with white QR stachycardia, whereby we do not see any uh, features of pre excitation. There is an option for for uh, adenos because, uh, as I said, some of these uh, rhythm abnormalities are caused by SCBTs, and uh, we can terminate these SCBTs uh, with adenosine. And if there is no baseline pre-excitation, the safety of adenosine has been shown in, in many of uh, many small-scale st studies uh, across the years. So, if there are no, uh, if there is no known pre-excitation. With the resting ECG or during uh, during the tachycardia episode, adenosine is an option even for uh, wide QR is tachycardia. Uh, for for uh, uh, if we know that patients have uh, pre excitation, then IV uh, is, is an option because it can slow conduction both in the in the, uh, the axillary pathway as well as the AV node. IV amiodarone can be considered, particularly if, uh, as I said, there is there are no 
etiology is not known and uh, there is no history of uh, pre excitation. Uh, but overall, uh, while approaching wild complex like this, uh, many of them, are close to 80% of them, they are caused by ventricular tachycardia, and approaching them as, as ventricular tachycardia is uh, more helpful. And uh, there have been uh, numerous criteria which has been uh, which have been suggested to differentiate between PT and SVT, but the, the the specificity of this criteria usually is not is, is not uh, more than seventy or eighty percent, and uh, many people or many experts recommend uh, approaching many white complex like this as as PTs. Uh, uh, so as I said, if patients are hemodynamically unstable, right away cardiovascular is important. But if they are stable, it can it can uh, can do vital maneuvers because they are safe. And uh, if there is no pre-excitation, IV adenosine can be uh, tried. And uh, IV procainamide is an option even if there is pre-excitation because it slows conduction both in the axillary pathway as well as in the uh, AV node. Chronic management usually will depend on the, on the type of the, the arrhythmia and the burden it presents to, to the patient. So in patients with excitation and with, with uh, manifest uh, SVT, tighter ablation is recommended. In those who are asymptomatic uh, with, with axillary pathways, we need to look for uh, high risk features. And we see high, these high risk features and if uh, we are able to, to, to do ablation with, with uh, low risk of complication, then uh, it's recommended to, to proceed with uh, ablation. But if there is no uh, manifest pre excitation, uh, uh, medical therapy is, is an option as well. Uh, usually, uh, for patients with uh, few symptoms which occur once or twice a year, uh, treating the episode may suffice, but Patients with uh, frequent recurrences, usually they require uh, chronic therapy. And if the patients are not adherent to the drugs or if the patients don't want to take the drugs and if they can afford uh, elect EP study and ablation, then that's an option for uh, the other tachyarrhythmias, uh, including AVNRT and uh, atrial tachycardia as well. Uh, and the medications, uh, the long-term treatment, Usually, uh, we need to look at uh, efficacy and safety as well for the absence of side effects. And uh, based on the specific type of the arrhythmia, beta blockers or CCBs are uh, preferred for many of them. And the other drugs uh, are also options. And where we see say a few things about the specific uh, SVTs in patients with the sinus tachycardia. Usually, management uh, depends on the course. We need to look for the course, and we need to exhaust all the investigations to look to look for the course. And if we identify the course, then we need to we just need to treat that. But if, uh, despite all the investigations, we don't have a clear cut course, then we label that as inappropriate sinus tachycardia, and we can treat these patients with uh, uh, either beta blockers. Or or uh, evapradin, uh, the sinus node uh, inhibitor or the funny current inhibitor. Uh, because of the the good efficacy as well as uh, reduced side effect profile with evapradin, if it's available, that is a preferred option. But uh, it's not widely available, and we can use beta blockers for many patients. Most of the patients with uh, inappropriate uh, sinus tachycardia, and for patients not responding to them, then uh, we need to look for uh, other uh, secondary options. And uh, focal atrial tachycardia, as I said, uh, this can be incessant or recurrent, and can result in uh, LV dysfunction. So patients with uh, LV dysfunction because of this uh, incessant tachycardia, ablation is a treatment of choice because it terminates the arrhythmia and thus the LE function uh, will, will recover within a few months after the ablation. But 
if it's not recurrent or if we do not have, we do not have the option for catheter ablation then we can try uh, drug therapy which uh, includes beta blockers or ccbs and, and uh, other drugs as well and for patients with uh, atrial flutter similar to patients with AFib, consideration of uh, anticoagulation is, uh, is based on the we use the charles vasque score so that score is uh, mainly uh, studied on AFib patients we, we can use that score and we need to start anticoagulation based on that and uh, chronic therapy it, it depends on the burden of the, the symptoms for patients with infrequent symptoms or infrequent exodus of atrial flutter, medical therapy is an option. Uh, and for patients with uh, recurrent episodes, uh, atrial ablation is his uh, choice and this is uh, effective in terminating the RET. For uh, AVNRT, acute therapy is, uh, as I said, depends on the hemodynamic. Um, MRI to the patient, but chronic therapy depends on the, the available treatment options and the burden of the symptoms. And tighter ablation of, of uh, the usual the slow pathway is, is uh, can be an achieve termination of tachycardia. For AVRT, as I said, the, the the management option for orthodromic AVRT, which presents as narrow complex uh, tachycardia, is similar to, to other SVTs. But uh, for those who present with, with pre excited uh, AFib, whereby uh, the SCVT has degenerated into AFib and that AFib is uh, propagating through an accessory pathway, uh, the treatment needs to focus on the accessory pathway and uh, either uh, cardioversion or use of uh, ibutilide or procainam procainamide, uh, the drugs which can affect the accessory pathway as well as uh, the, the uh, the AV node is, is recommended. And uh, uh, long term management for AVRT, as I said, is usually for symptomatic patients, unless uh, the patient does not desire to undergo ablation or unless uh, we do not have the, the, the setup, catheter ablation is a recommended therapy. Uh, in the rest of the cases, medical therapy can be, can be tried as well. And in asymptomatic pre excitation, as I said, based on the, the properties of the accessory pathway, uh, which is better studied with, with invasive uh, electrophysiology. Uh, so, pathways which can, which can uh, with short refractory periods and which can, uh, uh, we can propagate impulse in a fast way. It needs to be to be ablated because there are risk factors for for uh, uh, AFib related fast ventricular response and possible degeneration into AFib that can result in uh, sudden cardiac death. For low risk patients, uh, medical therapy or, or uh, follow ups can be can be helpful. And this is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you for your for your. Uh, Patients. Thank you very much, doctor. It was a nice presentation. So, doctor, if you can access the QA section, I believe there's one question. So, one question it says, what's the logic behind uh, AFib not being included in, in SVT? As I said, the mechanism of AFib it involves uh, tissues above above the AV node, and technically it is uh, supraventricular tachycardia, but uh, uh, traditionally, it has been it has not been included in uh, SVTs, and uh, it does not share many of the features of uh, SVTs. Particularly, uh, many of uh, atrial fibrillation patients have uh, persistent uh, arrhythmias, and the risk is entailed uh, by atrial fibrillation. Particularly, uh, the risk of uh, uh, cardioembolic stroke is specific to atrial fibrillation. And management focuses usually on, on, uh, uh, on reducing this risk of uh, uh, cardioembolic stroke. And this risk is not shared by the other SVTs except atrial flutter. And uh, that's why it is 
viewed as as, as a different entity and uh, you can also see the guidelines everything the, the studies carried out in, in uh in patients with with uh, uh, if it, they are they are separate studies and the patient profile is also very different from uh, other SVTs. SVT is really young, healthy patients with no significant comorbidities. But AV patients usually they are uh, all patients with with uh, significant other comorbidities, including coronary artery disease, heart failure, hypertension, and the like. And the patient profile is significantly uh, different to to categorize them as as uh, similar arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. Stable versus unstable uh, tachyarrhythmia, it depends on the, the, the hemodynamics of the patient, particularly the blood pressure. And uh, besides the blood pressure, patients can have uh, symptoms of heart failure, or uh, patients can occasionally also have uh, impaired uh, brain perfusion with altered alimentation. So if we see any of these features, we label the patient as having uh, unstable tachyarrhythmia and we proceed with with uh, electrical cardioversion, which uh, corrects the arrhythmia in, in a very fast uh, way, uh, and that's why that's how we classify them. Uh, chronic uh, management, there is no sp specific duration. Uh, so, as I said, patients with recurrent symptoms they need long-term treatment, be it medical treatment or ablation. So, if we ablate the patients, then we can uh, take them off medications. And they can they can have uh, uh, they are unlikely to have recurrence of symptoms unless there is undetected uh, additional accessory pathway or unless they, they develop other uh, type of arrhythmias. Uh, but for for uh, medical treatment, uh, there is no definite time. Uh, but occasionally, some patients with with uh, AVNRTs may develop uh, fibrosis of either either of the pathways and the, the arrhythmia may may uh, may stop recurring after that and for those patients we can we can uh, put them off medications and that's uh, that's an option uh, the other the risk of adenosine or other uh, drugs uh, that blocks the av node in patients with wpw syndrome particularly for for Axillary pathway that can conduct antigradely. Uh, adenosine by itself may induce AFib because uh, it reduces the, the refractory period of the atria. And uh, this AFib can, can conduct antigradely uh, via the axillary pathway. And based on the property of the axillary pathway, the, the ventricular response can be very high. And these patients can. can uh, can go into hemodynamic uh, instability. And these uh, very high ventricular responses can uh, occasionally degenerate into AV, resulting in uh, sudden cardiac risk. So we need to be cautious uh, in administering any AV blocking agents in these patients. Yeah, OK. I see other questions here. Acute management of ACVT in our setup. Uh, so. Vagal maneuvers, they don't, uh, they don't post anything. So uh, the, the, those are the, the, the first options. And uh, if the patient is unstable, then we need to proceed with uh, cardioversion. There is no uh, other option. And since, unlike AFib, there is no risk of uh, stroke in these patients, uh, we don't have to worry much on, on from patients of the cardioversion. And uh, if the patients are stable, then uh, some of the, in some of the setups we can have uh, IV beta blockers, and uh, adenosine is also available in some of the, the cardiac setups, and in other setups digoxin is available, and uh, in the other patients pure beta blockers can be tried as well, but the, the first line of treatment needs to be the vagal maneuvers, uh, and vagal maneuvers uh, including carotid massage and uh, the, the the Valsalva uh, maneuvers, they are uh, easy to, to perform. The other, uh, uh, how long should we wait for uh, card diversion after SVT? 
So the, we know the half life of the drugs. Uh, adenosine, the half life is very short, close to one minute. And if the patient is not responding in the first minute, usually the first dose we give is uh, uh, six milligram and repeated doses need to be of, of uh, higher dose, usually 12 up to uh, 18 milligram when administering via uh, peripheral lines. And if, if the patient is not responding to them, based on the availability, we can try uh, IV beta blockers. Uh, so metoprol, uh, IV metoprol can be available in some of the, the, the setups. Uh, IV smolol uh, is also an option, but it's, it's, it's not available in many of our setups. And uh, depending on the half-life of the drugs, if the patient is not responding to these drugs, then we can proceed with uh, uh, cardioversion. IV lidocaine, uh, the dose, usually it's a weight-based uh, administration with, with initial bolus doses. Uh, if the patient is responding to it, uh, we can proceed with, with uh, IV infusion, because the dose is uh, typically uh, uh, weight-based. Uh, so, how to differentiate uh, between orthodromic versus uh, antidromic AVRT? As I said, orthodromic, it uses uh, the, the fast pathway uh, or uh, the AV node for anti-grade conduction. And this, uh, the tachycardia is uh, narrow complex. But with, with antidromic conduction, the, the Anti-grade conduction is via the accessory pathway, and thus the arrhythmia maintains a delta wave and it is uh, of wide complex in duration. <coughs> uh, SVT use of amiodarone. Uh, there are no specific guidelines on the, on the duration of uh, use of amiodarone, but amiodarone is not the preferred uh, drug for, for uh, this, uh, this type of arrhythmias. Amidaron is more useful in uh, uh, VTAC, whereby we don't have the option for, for ICDs or, or uh, in atrial fibrillation, whereby uh, rate control is really optimal in many of the patients with, with, who are not that responsive to, to uh, beta blockers. <coughs> the, the risk of uh, adenosine or amidaron in patients with WPW syndrome and AFib I have already addressed. And uh, I think more of uh, the questions are similar. Uh, rate more than 200 per minute uh, can, be, can be considered as unstable. Yeah, the higher the rates, there is a higher risk of decomposition, but uh, more of uh, hemodynamic decomposition usually is more of uh, based on our evaluation of the, the hemodynamic uh, uh, features in the patient. So thank you for your uh, uh, attention yeah, thank, you and your session. thank you very much, Doctor. On behalf of and all our participants, we thank you very much for this nice presentation. And we hope to see you in the future with other uh, topics as well. So if you have anything that you want to add, let me give you the stage. Thank you. Have a nice, uh... Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. Ah. Good night. Okay, good night. Bye. So participants, thank you very much for attending the session.